Welcome in to episode 285 of the Sources A Podcast, your go-to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the growing KSR Podcast Network, presented by our very good friends at Justice Dental. We've got a very hectic show in store with a long list of things to get to. Pro Day, Big Blue Madness, Big Z's, Big Arrival, and the upcoming Blue-White game this weekend. But before we get started, a very quick message from our friends at Justice Dental. Sources say is presented by the great team at Justice Dental. Visit one of their two Lexington locations by scheduling an appointment online at justicedental.com or by calling or texting 859-543-0700. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Justice, and their team Look forward to seeing you soon. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very happy to be joined once again by the one and only Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. Sean, how the heck are you? I'm fantastic, Jack Pilgrim. And uh, you and I did not plan this whole green color scheme today. And this is not a Boston Celtics shirt. But Mine look is. at us. Being on the same page today, didn't even plan to be. It's like a luck of the Irish thing because uh, today is my son's due date and I have no son still. So I don't know if this is like our our just kind of working uh, working this in, you know, speaking this into existence because uh, maybe by the time you guys are watching this, I will have a son. Maybe I'll be in the hospital by then. We don't know. But uh, we are right, right up until the deadline and we didn't want to risk uh, starting a show and then having her water break and then having to go to the hospital or whatever the case may be. We just wanted to make sure we got this content ready to go. So uh, we are pre-recording this. I know our, our fans like the uh, the feedback and getting to, t- to talk to us and the comments and all that, but uh, just understand that, you know, we're, we're, we're trying here. We're, we're trying to get this knocked out before uh, this baby comes. It's, going to be this week though i i I am we're speaking this into existence i I feel it uh very well could be tonight very well could be tomorrow morning very well could be in the next couple days but uh if you see me next week something has gone terribly wrong so uh plan for this to be our our last kind of me show before uh the the season before um you know, oh, well, I'll take some time off, a couple weeks off, and then we'll be back ready to go. We will still have shows, Sean. You'll be here. We'll have my guy Zach Gagan on. We'll 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 still knock out some creative stuff and uh, get this happening. But I will not be a part of that that uh, that journey for the next couple weeks. Yeah, and uh, now that now that we're in a basketball season, we're going to have some on the court stuff to talk about. Blue white game coming up. We'll get into all that. We've got an exhibition coming up here pretty quickly too. So, no basketball season's here, and hopefully. Hopefully you'll uh, have a new addition to your family here very soon as well. I'm excited to like have him on my chest watching these games and like have to be a psycho, like screaming during the middle of the games, but like have to be like, you know, like whisper my excitement. I don't know. I've never really done that before. So we'll, we'll have to see. This is brand new territory for me. We'll see how it happens, but we're very excited. That's going to be a, a, an awesome time. Um, very, lo- very much looking forward to it. Very much looking forward to talking about a very busy weekend, I guess week plus that we've had uh, where we got pro day, where we we were both in attendance to see how uh, the Cats were looking in front of NBA scouts, 52 team personnel uh, and scouts in attendance to see how the Wildcats were performing in practice. There was a two day event. They were there at Rupp Arena on Wednesday night and then Thursday uh, early afternoon. They were there for another follow up practice. And then we got Big Blue Madness. Uh, Some good things came from that. Some bad things came from that. We'll talk about that. And then we'll obviously preview uh, the the the, uh, blue white game that's going to be in northern Kentucky. What what do you think about that real quick before we we jump into the nuts and bolts? What do you think about the move to uh, Truist? Truist Bank is that the Truist Bank Arena? Is that what it is uh, up in northern Northern Kentucky? What do you think about that move? I think the event's going to be for charity this year. Yeah, and, and you know, I said a few weeks ago, how could we make Big Blue Madness better? And I mentioned maybe we can just do the Blue White game as part of it. I, I'm going to go back on that and, and change that because I like what they're doing. There was a Pikeville last year, Northern Kentucky this year. I like that you're taking this fan base, not this program around, and seeing different parts of the state and kind of going to different corners and different areas. And there's going to be fans that are going to be in the building that night that this is probably the only time that they even go see Kentucky basketball in action. They don't make the trip over to Rupp Arena. The same thing in Pikeville back last year. I think it's a great idea. Where do they go next? Probably head out west at some point. I hope this is a tradition that continues. It just doesn't happen the next two or three years. I hope it's something that they can continue to do because here's the thing, Jack. Rupp Arena is never full for this event, for the Blue White game. There's too much going on this time of year. Take it to a smaller venue. Get a full crowd kind of take your your program on on the road 
And it, it's a good way to kind of show these guys the state, but also show fans what this program is about and kind of move it around. I think it's a great idea. And that was kind of the mindset with Big Blue Madness. Um, it did not present the flair that I think Kentucky was potentially hoping for. We talked about special guests potentially being in the stands. Those both fell through. There was one that was confirmed on the books. Like he was he was coming Lil Wayne. We didn't get to even really address that last week. We kind of hinted at it and said, hey, I'd be, you know, G's moving silence like lasagna. Ha ha. And like Cal came out to Lil Wayne music. They played Lil Wayne music throughout. It was like everything set up an appearance except for the actual physical appearance from from him so that sucked there's also uh, some some rumblings uh, about Lil Durk another rapper also making an appearance that was more like the every year there's a oh is John Wall gonna show up and do the John Wall dance again like you know there's like just kind of quiet whispers going on behind the scenes that was more of that one uh, and Lil Wayne was the confirmed guest so I, I did not hear what fell through there but uh, you know the event is just kind of, it, it is what it is. I would like to see it at Memorial Coliseum next year. I'd like to see them move it to, to Kroger Field one day. Uh, I know they've tried to do that in the past, but with the football schedule and, and how, you know, the, the home games aligning uh, with, you know, n- the bye week being too late and the, the home games being while they're supposed to be having Big Blue Madison just never worked out. Uh, but I do think that, you know, for what the event is, it's a recruiting opportunity. It's a chance to have all high profile recruits under one roof and the chance to talk to them all at the same time and kind of have your set up your meetings. We saw uh, Chuck Martin pull Malachi Moreno off to the side as we were leaving Rupp Arena, talk to him one on one for 20 minutes. That's what the event's about. You know, it's it, it it's an opportunity for fans to see it and enjoy it and just kind of welcome, you know, young fans get to welcome uh, the, the newest crop of talent in, but it's really not about basketball. It's not, it's supposed to be an entertainment uh, uh, opportunity. The uh, intro video was awesome. The, you know, just Kentucky is just a dream video was absolutely incredible. Um, but the event is what it is. It, they, they, there, there's not much more you're going to get out of it until you bring in a little Wayne, until you bring in a special guest or move it to Memorial Coliseum. And uh, I could see them doing that the next couple of years, but um, for what the event was supposed to accomplish, I think they did just that on Friday night. They did, and uh, I, I think that it was successful. You, like you mentioned, it's all about recruiting. It's and, and, and two, in, in the past, social media has changed things significantly from the days when Big Blue Madness and the, and the campouts. You get so much access to these guys now that Big Blue Madness isn't the first time that you see them. We got to see this group. In Toronto, we got to see them at Pro Day the other night. Fans get to see two, them every two, two days before yeah. that event. So it, it kind of it, it did kind of kill the mystique. It kind of killed the the mystery behind you know what Big Blue Madness typically is. And you get to see them every day on social media. Like there's one on one, there's interviews, there's there's cut ups and stuff with uh, UK Sports Network and interviews with Cameron Mills going up right now. Like there's so much kind of presented to the fan base now that Big Blue Madness kind of isn't that, oh, this is the first time that we get to see Reed Shepard in Kentucky Blue and White. This is the first time that we get to see uh, some others. Now, it was the first time you get to see Big Z, and that was kind of the highlight of the night. Now, Reed Shepard did get the loudest pop when it comes to the crowd and intros, but Big Z was right there, too. I, I love the Z, you know, the, the, the Z chant that, that kind of came over the crowd, like, it was a good night, Jack, like uh, going through the three point shootout. They actually presented the, the trophies and stuff this year. Antonio Reeves wins back to back the dunk contest. Joey Hart stole the show like there, there was a lot of good from the night. And Cal didn't talk a ton, which is different. Right. And I like it because Boogie, we did get Boogie there as a, as a big visitor. I thought that was cool for him to introduce Cal. But overall, I thought the night was a big success, and it was a good 48-hour window for the program to kind of kickstart where we're going here this week with the Blue-White game. Yeah, For the fan, the casual fan, I don't think it was a huge, huge win, you know, in, in terms of, you know, fan going, oh, my gosh, it's the best event I've ever been a part of. But, again, that's not what this is for. The event is a kickstart to college basketball season. It's a start. There's a, there's a reason why Cal, uh, you know, in the past, he has done the big state of the program. You know, usually when he has big things to address, when he has talking points that he wants out there, that's when he uses that platform where there are infinitely more eyes on that event than, you know, the blue-white game or, or whatever. Uh, he didn't have that this year. He knows what he has with this group. He's very confident in this group. There's a reason why in, in the past when he's talked about this group, uh, you know, 
uh, on SEC Network and on and ESPN on uh, Pro Day night. There's a reason why he was talking up this team as much as he was, and why he's excited and talking about yes, we got to get the big men, the big guys healthy. You got to get Ugo back. You got to get Aaron Bradshaw back. But he was talking about you know this team has the pieces to win a national title if those things come to fruition. What you know he doesn't think there's much le- le- much else to say beyond enough talking. Let's ball. Let's get 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 the season tipped off. So uh, I, I think that was the statement in itself was that there wasn't a lot of you know, he, he didn't need to talk. It was like, a we're, we're going to let the product speak for itself this season. And, and there's going to be plenty of opportunities coming up here to talk, right? SEC Media Days this week. You got Media Day locally with us coming up pretty soon, too. You're, you're just, what, less than two weeks away from the first Cal press conference post game when it comes to exhibition schedule, the radio show. There's going to be plenty of time for Cal to talk. I, I kind of liked it, though. It was just, I want to watch my team play. And it's kind of like a flying under the radar type thing that's going on right now with this program. They're flying under the radar, not only nationally when it comes to some rankings, which we'll get into, but maybe a little bit less talk this year, too, when it comes to maybe building this thing up. They're just getting to work. They're practicing. We know they're working hard in there. And it's kind of maybe a different approach than what we've seen over the course of his time in Lexington. And I'm fine with that. Given how the last few years have gone, Mix it up, change things up, and let's just uh, kind of lower our head and just go to work and just get ready for it when it matters. That was the vibe I got. It was, this event is what it is. We're checking this box. We'll do the blue carpet. We'll do the dunk contest, three-point contest. We'll pretend to do uh, a scrimmage, even though it was a full-court layup line again, and then we'll get out of here. Like, Cal didn't waste any time on, on the microphone. Say, appreciate you guys coming out. We'll see you next week. Big Z is going to make his uh, official debut by the remaining 1,000 tickets left for the blue-white game. We'll see you there. You know, there, that was it. That was the the show. It was very much business-oriented. We showed up. We did, you know, we, we played the charade and did the fireworks and smoke and all that stuff, but it's time to get to work. I, I, I liked that approach, uh, even if it didn't mean – a big musical guest or it didn't mean that it was played at Kroger field or Memorial Coliseum or whatever. The event did its job. Now it's time to focus on the real stuff. It, it is. And it's, it's one of those things that, I mean, it's, it's so close, right? Like the season's here now that you're going to have so many opportunities to talk and like whatever the preseason storylines are that me and you keep discussing and, and what we've had to discuss and what we want to discuss at this point, those preseason storylines are kind of out the window here in the next couple of weeks. And then it's real game stuff that we're talking about, how guys look. And people are going to have their own opinions of this program after a game or two. They're going to – they have them right now. But we know that ours will change, the outsides will change, and it will we'll see where we, we settle in at. But basketball season's here. And there's a lot of content coming your way here in the next couple of weeks. Like, we hit this thing running pretty quickly, Jack. Multiple – uh, exhibition games, a blue-white game coming up, and then the regular season opener now less, what, three weeks away? Right at it. Mm-hmm. So you're you're coming up, and then you got to match up with number one here in less than a month. Like, they get started and get off the ground pretty quickly. But I'm excited about it. I'm excited about this team. I'm excited about what we saw the other night. The, just the camaraderie that we're seeing with them, I think, is probably the one takeaway from Madness for me. You can't really, you don't get to see anything in madness. The, the scrimmages and stuff, it's about not getting hurt. It's about being there and putting on a show for the fans. Now, pro day, we did see some things that we can discuss. And guys are note they noticeably look different. And it's hard to believe that it was what three or four months ago that we saw these guys. I mean, time's flying by. I mean, before we know it, the NCAA tournament will be here. That's how quickly this thing goes by. Oh, that, that's crazy. Um, before we move on from madness, I, I did I did like Big Z you know, being introduced, I, I wish they had singled him out a little bit. Like we talked about, I wish there had been more of a, you know, maybe that is the entertainment. That is the the, the show part of Big Blue Madness. But they included him in the right, you know, right smack dab in the middle of the roster. You know, maybe either make him first or last, uh, introduce him in a different way. But maybe that's also the, you know, business approach that we're taking. We're not, you know, not one guy is bigger than in any of the rest. We're going to go right through that roster from top to bottom he was one of those guys but I did like seeing him go down the steps go down the little pathway uh and kind of like soak in that moment in front of Big Blue Nation I really did kind of appreciate that he got that time to kind of soak in the Z's and the uh you know the the roar of Big Blue Nation for the first that was his first look at college basketball was him standing at the end of that that little pathway holding on to that guardrail and was just like whoa like 
this is this is nuts. Twenty four thousand strong. Everybody chaining my name. That's pretty cool. It wasn't the the high end potential that they could have done with it, but I, I'm still glad that he got that moment. That's what we talked about on the last several shows. I just wanted him to be able to embrace that that you know make to make it all feel worthwhile. Uh, we got an interview one on one with him and and. John Calipari, that was kind of weird, but kind of awesome because it also stressed how ridiculous the academic side stuff stuff was. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, pro day, I talked to several scouts after the fact uh, to just kind of get their feel. You know, we we see pro day, and then it kind of transitions straight to Big Blue Madness, straight to Blue White game, and then the season begins, and you don't really get to see what those scouts do with the notes, what they do with the you know, the intel that they get while they're in Lexington for that two day stretch. So I reached out to several of them uh, to just kind of get, you know, pick their brain a little bit and see what the, the general feel is of uh, th this roster. First name that popped up out of everybody's mouth. Rob Dillingham was the, the best player in practice on Thursday. They were really impressed with how he looked Wednesday night at, at pro day. Uh, a very clear physical growth from what they saw in Toronto. They were, you know, not let down from what they saw out of him in Toronto, but he was not the guy that they were kind of hoping he would be in Lexington after he signed with Kentucky, after seeing him, you know, Peach Jam, all the different events. Um, so that was the biggest takeaway was Rob Dillingham was the guy they were really, really impressed with. Jordan, Bur uh, Jordan Burks made a ton of money for himself. That was the one guy that wasn't on anybody's roster that I, you know, they were like, wow, that was somebody that he kind of did everything he was supposed to and really made uh, his mark. Uh DJ Wagner, Reed Shepard, Antonio Reeves. I think the coolest part of those guys is you know exactly what to expect out of those guys. They the scouts know that Reed Shepard is an NBA level prospect. They know that DJ Wagner is that guy, and they know what to expect out of Antonio Reeves. So those are kind of my biggest takeaways. Uh, it sucked that we didn't get to see a do Thero. He rolls his ankle. That was one guy that I think they were internally excited to see, and you know they didn't get to see much of him at, at all. But uh, I, I love from what they were able to see, the scouts really enjoyed themselves at, at Pro Day. Yeah. And, and the thing with Rob, and you led off with Rob being the big takeaway there. And I agree with you. It, it wasn't as much about the offensive end for Rob. It uh, His body has obviously changed. He's added some size, he's added some strength, which he had to do, Jack, because he, to me, Rob, the, the thing that was. I think was most concerning about Rob after Toronto was if he was just going to be a guy that depended on making shots, I think that that sets up a pretty tricky situation to kind of sink or swim here. You don't want to just rely on, Hey, being a shot maker, you, you want his game to be to affect it defensively too. And I think that's where the added size is going to help him most is on the defensive end of the floor, him be able to hold his own with some of these sec guards, some of these division one guards but it's also going to help him. He can get to spots, but now he's got some size that he can help him finish in those spots as well. It's probably the the biggest noticeable change when it comes to him. But across the roster, Jordan Burks at that dunker spot, he's a guy that is playing significantly out of position from what he's played, but he's making the most of that opportunity. And there's going to there's a path there for him to get some early minutes with some injuries still being concerning going a concern going into the regular season. So. They're going to have to play some guys. Trey Mitchell cannot play 40 minutes at the five. And Big Z, we know, is coming along. Like, Jordan has been in this program since the summer. If he gets minutes at that spot, he's got to make the most of it. And I think he can make some plays on the back end for Kentucky offensively. But you mentioned the other three, DJ Reeves and Reed. Like, I've, I've got some takeaways for, about those guys as we get throughout this episode. But, man, like, there's some guys in this backcourt that you already trust. And I think that those are the kind of the three leading the way. Like DJ is a guy that you know that he is your leader. He he emerged as this team's alpha in Toronto. Like in the first summer practices, like it was funny watching him at, McDon at the McDonald's All American event um, this past this past season, where it's a bunch of guys that are alphas in their own right. You know, guys that have been at the top of their game at every step of the way. Uh, across the board at, at every level, basically since middle school. Like those are the, the best of the best of this class. And he immediately stepped on that court, Sean, and was like, yeah, no, this is my event. If you're going to be on my team, everything is going to revolve around me. And not like a, an arrogant way, but just a like, you know, when you command a locker room, you command it. Like it's, you know, pe you, people gravitate toward you. And that's, you know, it's it's nothing against anybody else. It's not saying the other guys don't know how to be a leader, but it's just that 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 DJ is that guy. And that's something that Cal even said on the 
the broadcast. I believe it was the Big Blue Madness broad. Was it Big Blue, Big Blue Madness or Pro Day broadcast? I, I, that where he talked about DJ's leadership. Uh, I can't. I've not gone back think, and listened. I to the think it was. Now. I think it was Pro Day. Uh, but Cal said, "I've never had a guy kind of command a locker room the way that he has." And he's a freshman. He's an eighteen-year-old kid. Like. That's something that this team needed, and I think that we've struggled with that in the last years. I remember midseason last year, we were going, who's the leader on this team? Who is stepping up when things are struggling? And that guy has already not only just presented himself now, but he already did back in July. Um, so that's something that I'm really excited for, that DJ, you know exactly what he's going to be. He's, you know, he'll shoot 35% from three. He'll shoot 30, 34, 35% from three, but that's not going to be his game. He's going to be a catch and shoot guy. Uh, when he does make, he'll create for himself, but he's going to thrive with paint touches, finishing around the basket, being kind of that slithery attack, you know, workhorse that's going to get to the basket and finish around, finish around the rim. That's what he's going to be known for in kick out to Antonio Reeves, kick out to Reed Shepard. That's going to be his role. He he knows who he is, and he's not going to try to do too much outside of that. That's why I think he's going to be so valuable for this team. I think he's going to be an excellent guy in the middle third of the floor when Kentucky does go to some ball screen offense, whether it be late in the clock, if, if some Trey Mitchell's setting some ball screen stuff there in the middle third. Like DJ, to me, when John Welch was putting them through their dribble drive drills the other day, you and you saw the progression drills that they go through attacking and getting downhill. The thing that separates DJ from other guys on this roster that the best guards do, he eats up space. He's good at working in space one-on-one. He's going to be able to get by his man, but he's also good at taking away space and using some of his strength and size at kind of absorbing the contact and being the initial, the guy making the initial contact first. You saw him getting downhill, finishes off two feet very well. Jack, to me, he's an in-rhythm shooter that it's more of a in rhythm flow. Like the, you saw the other night, like he, he didn't shoot the ball the best at, at, at times, but that's not in rhythm. Like he's more of an in rhythm guy handling the ball off the bounce and then, and then stepping into that three point shot. But him and Trey Mitchell in the middle third of the floor, I'm already seeing a ton of options that Kentucky can do offensively. And a lot of it is all because of how strong DJ is. DJ's got the size and, and the strength to put somebody on his back and keep them there on a hip and make a play, maybe snake some stuff out of these ball screens, but also has the explosiveness to get a ball by a hip and go finish and get something for his own. But he's going to impact the game a ton. Like if they chart paint touches from him alone, it's untelling how many times he gets two feet in the paint with the ball in his hands. And that's not just finishing over top of somebody. That's kicking that thing out, like you said, to Antonio Reeves, to Reed Shepard. They've got some guys, and you noticed it when they were doing the dribble drive breakdowns from the corner. I've told you this since the summer. They're so good at eating up space, meeting the ball in the pass, that there's already a two- or three-foot gap that is closed, and they're already downhill and by you. If you're in help, they're attacking help, and they're attacking it, and you're going to have to keep up. And that's the thing that I think John Welch has kind of added to this. That's stuff that I didn't see Cal do at Memphis or early on in his days at Kentucky when they were a lot of ton on dribble drive motion. I'm seeing it now, and I think that's an adjustment that's being made over the last few months that Kentucky is taking advantage of eating up that space, and let's put pressure and get these guys on their heels. Like They're, they're going to be hard to guard in the backcourt this year. Now, the only negative, I guess, and, and it, it depends on how you take you know negative. Obviously, you want to hear positive news about Bradshaw and, and Ugo in their uh, health. But it was kind of a moving target at Pro Day. Uh, you got anywhere from four to seven weeks from John Calipari. Uh, then we even got like a December timeline potentially. So that was moving a little bit. But then we, I, I think more of a firm grasp on it at Big Blue Madness where he said, we expect them back in five weeks, both of them. Now, I think something that people are forgetting is that they are two individual human beings, two individual seven-footers, with two separate in injuries, two separate surgeries, two uh, an entire month apart. So understand when there is this gap between, hey, we like them back in four weeks to December. Understand that you're also talking about two different people. So it's it, it, I feel like Cal was cr overly criticized for you know kind of the moving target that was that, but also understand that. You talk about two different guys. What if Bradshaw's back in four weeks and Ugo doesn't come back till December? He's still technically correct in that. Uh, and I, I think that was his version of being transparent. Instead of taking hell for, you know, people saying, oh, I've, you know, he Cal just hasn't seen him again, you know, 
he was trying to give a legitimate timeline for return for his two injured seven footers. I appreciated that. Even if it wasn't necessarily what you were wanting to hear, obviously you want them to be back at practice right now. Obviously you want them to be ready for the the opening tip of the, op- uh, of the opening game, but you appreciate the transparency, Cal's version of transparent. It was close enough for me to understand, okay, they're not ready right now. They may not even be ready for that opening tip uh, against New Mexico State on November 6th, but you get a loose timeline of they're going to, it's early season. You're not waiting until conference play for them. They're going to be ready enough before things really, the, the train gets really far down the track. And that's all I need to, that, that's all I need to hear. I, I appreciate that level of transparency. Uh, and I'm still expecting them both to be back. You know, even behind the scenes, I've heard uh, Bradshaw is probably closer than Ugo, if I had to guess. Um, so I think if we're talking, who's going to be back first. I'm, I'm projecting Bradshaw to be back and then Ugo, uh, but both of them are going to be back in plenty of time. And you're going to be able to, to figure out what this front court looks like sooner rather than later. I would not sweat the individual comments that Cal made in either of those events. And Cal would be out of his mind if he gave a definite date, right? Like, cause then you're kind of opening yourself up that if it doesn't work out, then you're going to get criticized, right? Like if you say, oh, they're going to be back by champions and they're not out there champions, then you have to openly discuss, okay, well, what happened? Is there a setback? Is there something here that has delayed it? So I, I think that that was pretty transparent with saying and giving a time frame, but even more so now that you, you look at this thing, like when I, I was telling you upstairs, when he said the the initial timeline there, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I told you, I said, well, you you got to get in practice shape. You've got to get out there and get in rhythm before you just throw somebody out there into a game. So maybe that adds another week or two to what they want to do. But, but Jack, I think when it comes down to it, by the time Kentucky gets into North Carolina and that part of the schedule in December, in my mind, I'm hoping and, and kind of confident that you should be right there at full strength unless there's something else that happens or some setback that we don't see coming. But Kentucky is going to have guys get opportunities from this. You mentioned you know negatives. You don't want anybody hurt, but if there is a positive to this, Big Z is going to get opportunities that maybe he that I'm I'm going to say he definitely would not get if Bradshaw and Ugo were healthy because they'd be eating up minutes along with Trey. With those two being out, it kind of forces Big Z to get thrown in there now and at least catch up. Like here, we're going to throw it at you. You're going to get opportunities to get on the floor and play. He does two things, Jack that I don't think you have to be in rhythm with what they're doing to, to be able to do it well. He blocks shots, and he can space the floor and shoot the ball. I don't care how in sync you are with anybody. You can do those two things just stepping out here and playing. Or even a, a third, he runs the floor well and dunks the ball. The like, yeah. That, he, he, again, he adds yeah. something that they don't have right now on this roster. He adds a rim protector, whether that be five minutes or ten minutes a game here in exhibitions. I'm interested to see what he looks like in this blue-white scrimmage. How much can he absorb and how quickly can he absorb? That's just getting him on the floor, getting him a taste of it. That's why the blue scrimmage, the blue white game is good. Then you get a couple of exhibitions. You get some games there. I don't think that he's going to be playing north of 15 to 20 minutes when Kentucky gets the champions, but they may need him that night against Hunter, Dick- against Hunter Dickinson. They're going to need some, some size there. But the big story here is Kentucky's on track with everything that John Calipari has been saying. Everything that we've been hearing about the injuries and stuff with Bradshaw and Ugo, there it's it's right there on that timeline. Yeah, the the timeline was beginning of the regular season. Like, I think when people heard four to six weeks or whatever, they went, "Oh my gosh, basketball season is here, and we still have another month." Well, it's like yes, but the first regular season game doesn't begin for another month, so we're we're you know. We're still right on track. Everything is totally fine. From when he said that, I think the five week mark was the week of Champions Classic. Was that right? Yeah, I, it, I was. So. it was exactly right there on that on that. And that's close, right? Like you, I think there needs to be some give and take with this. Like it's not a definite date. Five weeks. It could be the game of Champions. It could maybe it's a game or two after Champions. I don't know. Like. I'm with you, though. It's not going to be both of them just walk through the door together and they're miraculously on the same time frame and they're healed and and they're ready to go. Like, this is two separate human beings and bodies and feet. Like, one of them is on a different timeline than the other. It wouldn't shock me if somewhere around champions you get Bradshaw back and then you go a couple of weeks and then Ugo comes back into into the fold. And you get Miami late in the season at Rupp, like or in November at Rupp, maybe 
if there's some progression there, maybe you're ready to go. But my hope is you got one of them back by that game because I think that's a winnable game on your home floor that that you need for NCAA tournament seating and, and purposes like that. So I'm I'm looking at this thing entirely differently. Like I, I think that this is a good thing, not necessarily that they're hurt, but it's going to throw some guys into the fire early that it's gonna ha- you're going to have to fight, and you're going to f- learn about guys that we would not have had opportunities to learn about. Then you get those two back, and there's plenty of time to get them ready. I think that this only makes Kentucky deeper and stronger as they go throughout the season. I really do, because it's giving guys opportunities to make an impact early that would not be getting those impacts in those in those moments. And run Dickinson off the floor. Run run him as, as much as you can. Everybody keeps worrying, well, what, what are they going to do to slow down Hunter Dickinson? He's the most dominant big man in college basketball. You he also has to guard you. Yep. You also he also has to guard you. He uh, make make if if you're going to introduce Big Z to the college basketball world, run him, run him next to Hunter Dickinson. Yes, he's going to get destroyed, you know, from a size size disadvantage. But if you run him up and down the floor and exhaust him, then you know you you also have they have to play to you too. This is a team that you you can play to your strengths. And beat Kansas that way. That's that's my only thing. Everybody keeps talking about Hunter Dickinson. Oh my gosh, how are we going to be ready to stop them? I also really love Kentucky's guards in Kentucky's backcourt, where I don't think that Kansas can compete with what Kentucky has to offer on that end of the floor. We got the we got the dudes to run, run them. Let's let's and, and if you well, lose in a, if you lose in a track meet, then then you lose. Then but I, I like the pieces that you have, even considering the injuries that Kentucky has right now. So we're, we're getting into a Kansas preview a little bit too early here, but I'm going to throw my two cents in as well with this because I've actually had this conversation with a couple of people. I know I've talked to you all in the group chat about it as well. That game is one, like you said, where Kansas, sure, there's people that are going to say, well, how's Kansas, how's Kentucky going to guard Kansas in that size? Well, if, if, if you're worried about that, you can't tell me that Bill Self and Kansas aren't worried about how they're going to guard Kentucky because Kentucky will have the ability in that game to shrink the floor a little bit. And do some things, and which some things that I think Kansas will struggle at as you go throughout the season. I'm not trusting that backcourt to consistently make shots this season. I'm trusting Kentucky's, but where Kentucky can kind of shrink the floor and you're guarding 25 to 30, 25 feet, Kansas is going to have to guard Kentucky 90 if they're going to play small. Like these guards getting downhill, getting in transition, like that's going to be tough to guard. Kentucky can run some double teams at Hunter Dickinson. I'll also say this. This is a coaching staff that has experience matching up with him a year ago. They've got some tape. They've seen some things. How much has Hunter Dickinson changed from December until now? Zero. He Absolutely is he is. zero. Is he a great player? Yes. Is Kansas going to be a very good team? Yes. Can Kentucky win that game? Absolutely. And, and, and. They will enter that game as the number two team in the history of college basketball in terms of all-time wins because, thank goodness. I loved that, you know, that like as the report was coming up from the IARP of, oh, no, they're going to get a slap on the wrist. Come on, man. The NCAA, they're frauds. They're spineless. And then like as you're ramping up your frustrations about – Gosh, I just hate the NCAA, man. They're they're just a bunch of cowards. Then you get the one update of, but they will have to vacate 15 wins. And therefore, drum roll, please. Kentucky is the all-time winningest program in college basketball. Once again, maybe by off of a technicality, we will ignore that that caveat. But but we can now say going into this matchup that Kentucky is the all-time winningest program in college basketball. And for that, I'm very excited. You get a champion's classic where once again, it is number one versus number two in the correct order, not flip-flop the way it has been in recent history. Recent yeah. Thank yeah. goodness. And it's number one versus number 16 if you go off the pulse, right? And, yeah. and things. But you're right. Like we, a week ago, we're sitting there trying our best to kind of navigate. So where is the win total? Where Where is this now? And and things and and then you see it and you're like oh there's a final four and a Big Twelve tournament title and 15 wins that are now poof off the board and at first I didn't see that when I was looking at everything because I was like oh this is a slap on the wrist but and it ultimately ended up being right like when it comes down to it like they're they avoid the biggest penalties of all but Kentucky is back in it 
they're back at number one and it, it, it feels right to kind of uh, read that on bios and things now on uh, social media when Kentucky is the winningest program and in, in college basketball history. But it's one of those things that you better, you better keep it rolling or Kansas will pass you again. It's not a wide margin. I mean, it, it's there. So you, you want to add one to your side by getting a win here in November, but no, that, that game is still a ways away, but we're going to be talking a ton about that one over the next few weeks, it seems like, because that's the that's the first one where we're going to look at and see, okay, where is this current version of Kentucky? But that'll be my one take going into it, Jack, when we and you were up in Chicago. Whatever we think of Kentucky on that night is not what we're going to be thinking of Kentucky six or seven weeks down the road. If they look great, I think they can look even better. If they look eh, I know they're going to look better. I think that there's some confidence going into that matchup. And it's kind of a – you're kind of playing with house money, right? You don't have your full group of guys. If you do, they're not going to be what they are in March. I think Kentucky has a high ceiling that that Kansas – I just don't trust those guards to make shots. And that's why I love Kentucky being the consensus number 16 team in college basketball to open the season. The AP poll and the coaches poll came out on Monday. Uh, and – I, I appreciated that because it gives you room to move up. It gives you something to work with, but there's also a, you know, a, a, it's a, it's a where things stand currently. It gives you credit for how talented the guards are in the backcourt, but it also accounts for front court depth issues right now and, and the injury status and just the unknown there. That's why they're not in the top 10, but that's also why they're not, 25 or unranked, unless you're John Fanta and have no idea what you're talking about. It, the, the people that get it and understand what this team looks like, they understand that that 12 to 20 range is comfortable. And the analytics back that up with Ken Palm coming out uh, with Kentucky at number 18 overall, uh, believing and agreeing with what we've been saying all offseason, that this is going to be a really, really, really talented offensive team. They're opening at number 10 in the country and, and offensive efficiency. 35th in, in defensive efficiency. We've talked about that. If there is going to be a struggle with this team, it, it is going to be uh, with, you know, just ha- you're going to have to win track meets. You're going to have to win high scoring battles. I think this team's going to struggle a little bit defensively, and that's okay because I also think that the offensive weapons are that talented where it's really not going to matter all that much. If you win games 90 to 78, you're still winning by d- double digits and things things are looking fine and dandy. I like where things stand. I like 16 in the official rankings, and I like 18 in the Ken Palm, especially that 10, 10 overall offensive efficiency uh, in particular. Yeah, I, I definitely think this team is being significantly undervalued. I have said that on this show for the better part of six or seven weeks now. I, I said it on Twitter yesterday. I'm actually sitting here reading something on from CBS Sports where they named one of Kentucky the most under underrated teams in the AP poll from where the rankings are. Interesting though, they named Tennessee as one of the more overrated teams. And I know I'll have some takes on, on that and stuff as we as we go throughout the season, but I do think that Kentucky is being undervalued. And I think the last three years are why. That is the only reason why Kentucky is at 16 today. And the highest vote that they received in the AP poll was eighth. I know Dick Vitale had them at 13. A couple people had them nine, 10, 11. They literally had like from eight to 25. They had a vote in every category. And then they didn't also two had people have five. Didn't- yeah, didn't well, a couple of you have was, unranked? It was actually updated. I think there were five guys as the, as they all came through yesterday that did not have them ranked at all, and that's to me is just unreal. But their their margin, right? When it, when you're talking eight to unranked, like, and th- so it settles at sixteen. Like that's that's where you're 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 getting at. Th- this is a team that's going to outperform. This is going to be a year where they're going to finish higher than their preseason ranking. It's hard to do that when you're one and two unless you win the whole thing. Or something, but this is the lowest ranking they've had under Cal. The other one was 2010, 2011 with Brandon Knight team. They were they started 11th, made it to the Final Four. But I'm okay with where they're at. Like it to me, it doesn't matter. And and this is a thing where you have two experienced seniors coming back, a lethal scorer Antonio Reeves that can do it at all three levels. You got Trey Mitchell who has played a ton of basketball. This is his fourth college basketball program. He's seen it all. He's had success. He shoots it well. A veteran. And then you add in the number one recruiting class. And I get it. If you're throwing injuries into that preseason ranking, maybe. But 
the other stuff though about just talking about that you don't trust Kentucky to do this or or you don't have them ranked at all, you're just completely missing the point. Because if this were anyone else's roster, they'd be probably in the top five with the number one recruiting class in, in those in those groupings. Now, here's where rankings doesn't matter. North Carolina last year, preseason number one, did not make the NCAA tournament. First time it's ever happened in the AP poll. UConn was not ranked in the preseason poll, and where'd they go? The most the dominant team in college basketball by the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. So don't get caught up in it. I'm not getting caught up in it. I'm just putting out the history of the AP poll yesterday, and I didn't want people taking that as a negative thing that I'm saying, well, this is Cal's lowest-ranked team, blah, blah, blah. That's not piling on Cal. It's just saying it's wild how – all these other years where I didn't think they actually deserved number two or number three, this year kind of feels like maybe we got to see them a little bit on the floor this summer and how they look that they should have been higher. But I guarantee you John Calipari is perfectly fine with 16. He probably wanted them to be out of the top 25, if you ask me. It, because it, it perfectly addresses the concerns, but it also, you know, like if you, as you said, if you view it as undervalued, in the grand scheme of things for what the ceiling is completely agree. But considering the current issues that this team is dealing with, with the, with the front court health and the depth, you know, or lack thereof, I get it. I, I agree with that, but I also, you know, that's also with an understanding that they're going to take some early lumps. They're going to lose a couple games early because that, you know, that experience and the, the, the potential Injury issues present themselves, and it's too much to overcome, even with the offensive talent that this team has. And I'm totally okay with that because this team, the long journey that it, it has, it's going to be a fun ride. And it's one that I feel very strongly that by the end of the year, considering how closely and, and cohesive this unit was in July and where things stand and what I've heard behind the scenes about what they look like and what we've seen with our own two eyes, how quickly they've meshed and gelled. Now, I, I can only dream of what that's going to look like by the end of this by the end of the season when we get Aaron Bradshaw and Ugana and Big Z looking the way they're supposed to. If by the end of the year Big Z is playing five to ten really strong hard minutes or potentially more, maybe he's you know maybe he it clicks for him and he becomes a star. I appreciated that ESPN's Jonathan Gavoni put out his list of top ten international freshmen and put him at, at six, saying exactly what we've said. He does things as a seven foot two guy that nobody else in the world can do, but he's also really young. He struggles with physicality. He's this, he's that. You're you're creating that cushion both ways. That I I'm that's why I'm okay with 16. It's far enough down where it accounts for some early lumps, but it's also, you know, an indicator of what what this talent, you know, that the, the talent that this team has and what they can be at the end of the season, which I think they can finish as a national title contender by year's end. And that's all that matters. It, it would it wouldn't shock me if by the time we get in December this team's in the top ten, right? You have opportunities. You're 16. You're going to probably stay at that number going into Kansas just because there's not going to be. I don't think there's going to be a ton of shuffling in the top ten there early, unless you lose to someone and you, you in know, a week. Yeah. Not, and I don't think that that's happening early. But you go beat Kansas at Champions, you're in the top ten. If you lose to Camp, Champ, Kansas and Champions and you play a tough game, you get Miami coming to your home floor later in the month, who's number 13 in the preseason AP poll. And I expect them to be a team in that area for the entire the entirety of the season. You get another opportunity to prove yourself. By the time you get into league play, this, this team I think will settle in somewhere in the top 10 or somewhere around that number. But am I allowed to read what Kyle Boone wrote from CBS Sports? Because sure. I think it's right on top of what we said. He said, I think we may be factoring recent failures too much, in, too much into projecting this UK team. Have we not been saying that? That it's yeah. the last three years are being – it, it it is being cast onto this team's back. They're being punished. Yeah, they're, exactly. They're being punished. On paper, this is a clear top ten roster from a talent perspective, and I'm not ready to write Calipari off yet. But that also means don't punish them for the. Or if you're going to put them at 16 now, don't overly punish them and knock them out of the top 25. Their first hiccup. Like if you're going to give them that leeway, that cushion of, okay, we're not putting you in the top 10 because we're accounting for some of those early issues. And then they struggle with those issues. Don't punish them and put them out of the top 25. Keep them, you know, make it a move, the, the moving target a couple spots here and there so they can build up, but also don't just kick them out for the sake of doing it. Like there's a reason, the reason why you're putting them at 16 in the first place is to account for some of those issues. So don't double dip. Like you, you, you can't, it doesn't work that way. 
account for some of those issues. If if you they had put them in at 10 or eight or top five, then we could have seen a, a stiffer fall. But because they're, I think they're accounting for that, I think we're going to see less shifting at the bottom of that top 25. And I think that's fair. It is. And when the SEC media poll and stuff comes out this week, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make my prediction that this is going to be a, a three-team race between Tennessee, Texas A&M, and Kentucky to win the, the regular season. Agreed, with time. I, I fully believe that. Schedule will play a role in who wins it, I think, whoever has the toughest schedule. I've not kind of looked at Tennessee's schedule or a and schedule. I know Kentucky only plays a and once. They do play Tennessee twice. But that's why I never have valued in today's game winning the regular season title in a conference because you may play the best team twice and, and the best team may play the worst team twice. Like it, it kind of, it, it doesn't give you an accurate champion in my opinion, but I want to see Kentucky near the top of that because they've not won it in a while. They've not shared it since the Tyrese Maxey season. They've not won the SEC tournament title since Shea Gildas Alexander. Like I think it's time to get back to doing those things or competing for them. Uh, Tennessee was one of the teams that, that Kyle had is overrated. I've talked to you about it. I got to see those guys last week. They're tough. Not just on the defensive end. I think this is going to be one of Rick Barnes' better scoring teams, which is kind of – he's they're being punished from what they've been, the same way Kentucky's being punished from what they've been the last few years. Like They're not going to be winning games 58-53 this year. Not this year. Not this year. They're not. They're going to score the ball. Those two backcourts, whew, you're going to be plugged in to watch those two backcourts go at it when Kentucky plays Tennessee, because I'm telling you, Tennessee's got some veteran guards that do it at a clip. But Kentucky, to me, Kentucky's got the higher ceiling when it comes to the youth factor. There's more room to grow when you're younger. But Don't you become a Tennessee homer on us? Don't, don't, because you no. get a little bit of access with that program. Do not <laughs> flip your tone. You, I'm this, not this, is, this is a, this is a Kentucky <laughs> love, Tennessee hate show, whether Rick Barnes is nice to you or not. So don't, don't, don't flip on us. Or, no, or and you'll, not, you'll be casted away. And I'm not going to get into what they do and stuff like that because I, I respect him way too much and stuff. But I'm just I'll, I'll tell you that it's going to be a year. The SEC is going to have some teams that I think can do some damage and, and stuff. And it's going to be a fun, fun year to watch. But don't be shocked if if here I'm going to say it. There's going to be two teams from the SEC that are going to finish in the top 20 in both offensive and defensive efficiency this year. Kentucky and Tennessee. That's where I'll leave it at. Let's revisit in February and let's see if I'm wrong. But I'm telling you, like those two teams, I believe are both going to be right there. It's it, for Tennessee, it's about getting over the hump, right? And for Kentucky, it's just about getting it all the pieces together. Are you confident about this team being a top twenty defense? Kentucky being a top twenty defense? That's the at one full, thing at full strength. That, yeah, yeah, at full strength, it take. I mean, it's it's an efficiency number, right? There's going to be shot blocking on this roster that they have not had the last few years. That's going to help them a ton. And then I think they got more ball stop, like some guys that just stop penetration one on one. I think DJ is going to become a guy that can do that. Reed is a high IQ defender. He's always in the right spot. He reads passing lanes very well. Jeff was the exact same way. Like you click on a tape from 96 to 98 and see how many times you watch Jeff Shepard get in the passing lane and break away for a dunk. That's going to be read this year at Kentucky. You got to see that in Toronto blocking some shots. To me, it's about the rim protection on the back end because then that helps you on the offensive end as well because as lethal as this team can be in transition, you block a couple of shots and you get these guards out and running, holy cow, defense play, defense transitions in the offense pretty quickly when you can do that. And if Kentucky has a guy on the back end that can give these other four players on the floor confidence to defend and pressure the heck out of the basketball, look out. I do think this team will be settled in as a top 20 team in both categories by season end. A top 10 human being in my book, Andy Ludicky, this uh, in myperfectfranchise.net. Andy is a franchise consultant as well as franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets, financial requirements, time to commit, and more. His services are 100% free, and he is here to help. If you have any questions about business ownership, you can learn more and contact Andy anytime at www.myperfectfranchise.net. And uh, our guys at game time, as always, we appreciate them and uh, them emerging as the uh, go-to ticket source for Big Blue Nation uh, for my money. Uh, nobody beats them, but 
it, it, you, you've had several experiences with them. I know you love what they bring to the table. You shouldn't have to worry. Uh, when you're buying tickets, now isn't the time for guesswork. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and the best price guarantee, Game Time does all of the hard work for you. We told you uh, to, to get your, your tickets to the Florida game uh, a couple weeks back. That was a sellout. The crowd was absolutely incredible for that football game. Keep doing that for basketball season. Basketball tickets are now available. Champions Classic is on there, Sean. I know you uh, looked in and saw that. Um, I don't didn't get to see if the blue white game is on. I know tickets were already as limited as as they were uh, leaving Big Blue Madness. I think Cal said there are only a thousand tickets left, but go check on that, see if that's available. But you know, the beginning couple games, New Mexico State, November sixth. Go get those tickets there at game time. You do not want to miss that. There. Um, did you check? Did, is is blue uh, uh, blue white game on there? Uh, I'll look and then see. Um... One thing I will say is these early season games, Jack, when it comes to attendance, I know they've not been well, right? They've not gone well when it comes to – because there's a, there's a lot that plays into this, right? These Friday night November games, high school football playoffs in the state of Kentucky are going on, Lexington, Lexington schools and things. There, there's high school football around the place. But to me, it would be a it would be a pretty big statement that you're behind this group if you can get out there and pack Rupp Arena out as much as possible. And, and the Game Time app is going to be the best way to do that. Like you said, those games are on there. Did you pull it up? Yeah. No blue-white game, but we got Georgetown, Kentucky State, New Mexico State. All of the – basically everything from the first exhibition game on is available as easy as possible. Again, it's like almost too, too easy. You click on a game and then, like, the tickets are there for you and you just hit purchase and, like, you have them on your phone. So – the, it tells you the cheapest options, tell you the best deals, uh, all in prices, so you don't have to worry about the fees and all that nonsense. Uh, and with it, it's, it's two games, too. You get tickets to mm -hmm. both games if with champions. It's not just UK and Kansas. You get the Duke-Michigan State game in there as well. So if you're looking at prices, that's why. Yeah. Game time has the deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, and even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last-minute seats, find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more with zone deals. You pick the section, and Game Time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings, and the Game Time guarantee means that you will always get the best price if you find Tickets in the same section and row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference, which is ridiculous. I mean, that's just free money at that point. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code KSR for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code KSR for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Uh, Sean, blue white game. What are you? looking forward to this weekend in Northern Kentucky. I know you're going to the game. What do you want to see from your cats? Understanding that you're going to be down Aaron Bradshaw, you're going to be down Ugon Onion. So what do you need to see from this group ahead of the exhibition slate, which begins, what, a week from today, I think? Whatever it is, we're, we're right there. So uh, what do you need to see uh, this weekend to get us to the exhibition slate? So a week from Friday, right? I believe 27th is that Friday, first yes. exhibition game. So, I mean, we're here, like you said, but it'll be less than a week when we're at Northern Kentucky watching them play blue white game. I think to me, it's my whole word's been not overreact, right? And all the stuff that I'm coming back up with these numbers of being a top 20 team in both categories, that's not overreacting. That is months of me looking at this and diving into it and just on paper projecting where I think this team will be. What I'm looking for Saturday is – how much growth did we see in a five on five setting from a Rob Dillingham and guys like that? And what does big Z look like is that's the game where I think you put him out there and you play him as much as possible. What Just do you have play. to lose? Let do him it. play. Like to me, like it, it, he bring him out to give him a breather here and there, but I'm going to say that he's in pretty good shape. I'm, I'm going to say that was being communicated when he was there in Croatia and things about, Hey, you got to be in shape. That's the one thing that you can control right now. Control the controllable. And that is the one thing you can control. Work on your game, be in shape. Play him. Let's see how comfortable he looks. What do, what does some some other guys look like? Uh, a Duthiero, I know, just rolled the ankle and, and stuff. Like uh, I hated that for him in, in Pro Day moment where you're looking to put on performance for scouts, not just in the Pro Day television thing, but the practices afterwards as well. What does he look like? How does this backcourt shoot it? Like who's getting reps at the one? 
like one-on-one matchups I'm looking up here. Are we Do we get DJ and Dilly? Do we get DJ and Reed going one-on-one? Like, what are some do, defensive matchups? Does Cal put those two against each other to see the cream rising to the top head-to-head? Or do you continue to, like, because you know that they're going to be on the floor together, do you have DJ and Dilly together to continue to build that? Can- like, I that's going to be an interesting dynamic I'm keeping a close eye on. Do Does Cal set up the head-to-head battle there? And there's a, yeah, that's, that's interesting to, to follow and see, but there, there's going to be moments too, where I think you're going to see Kentucky's five on the floor together at some point for a segment. And we'll kind of be able to be like, okay, that's probably the five we're going to see roll out against Georgetown here in six days from Friday or Saturday. So the one thing I will say is you're not, we're, we've talked a ton about what Kentucky does in space. They'll play in space, but you're not going to see sets. You're not going to see a lot of stuff being ran that is not random because you're, it's just tape, right? You're not going to put anything out there before you get into this thing, and then you're going to have two exhibition games. By the time they play Kansas, like they're going to have three or four games of scouting reports that you can put together. Uh, but random basketball. You know where else I heard that word this week? In Knoxville. Enemy, enemy, enemy territory. So random basketball, it's – to me, and to me, I think that gave me confidence to trust that what we saw in Toronto is what we're going to see now, because you know Rick and Cal talk a ton, mm-hmm. yeah. and to hear random basketball come out of John Calipari's mouth, and then to go to an SEC rival and hear it out of Rick Barnes' mouth too, leads me to believe that they've they've talked, and that too, that transition to the game has made its way not just from the NBA down, but to to college basketball. And How you're about seeing that quote it, from Cal. Yeah. How about that quote from Cal? We're not going to create plays. We're going to create space. Boom. My best teams create space, not plays. Yep. And I don't think we're going to see, like, I, I think we're not going to see anything run in, in Northern Kentucky. Like, I think the entire game is going to be random basketball just to see what you got. They didn't run a whole lot in Toronto either. And you got to see them kind of at their best doing their thing. And I, I think, that was something that we talked about last year where it was like, why did they feel better in the Bahamas competition aside? Why did they feel better in the Bahamas than they did in the middle of the season? Yes. The competition was different, but I also felt that they were almost overcoached in a way that you didn't get that random basketball felt like they were trying to do too much. And instead of just letting the guys play, maybe it was just because the personnel personnel wasn't what it is this year. But I think that's going to be a big point of emphasis, just letting your dudes be dudes. Yeah. Well, Rick, I, you know, I, I told you that I got to sit down and, and talk to, to Rick Barnes there for a moment the other day. And I know well, I'm not getting carried away with Tennessee. I'm just telling you, like, this is the mm-hmm. way the game is transitioned. But he was telling me about a play that happened in practice a couple, like a week or so ago. And he looked at his assistants and he said, man, he said, we ought to draw that up. Or somebody said, we ought to draw that up. And he said, no, if you draw it up, it won't work. <laughs> like, because it's just the rent. So that it goes hand in hand with what you just said. Like, let these guys just play basketball. Put them in space. Give them two or three things. And then it's just about reading and reacting to defenses and what defense give you. If you're overplayed, you back cut. If a, if a guy goes over a ball screen, maybe you snake it and get downhill and do some different things. Like there's just play basketball. These guys know how to play and just let them play in space. And I think you're going to see Kentucky doing that. Now, one more note about defensively. To me, when Kentucky plays Kansas here, if Big Z is at a point where he can play some minutes, you add some length and some shot blocking. But I don't know if it's going to come from on the ball with Hunter Dickinson. To me, your shot blocking is elite when it comes from help. And that could be a game where you see Trey Mitchell match up on match up on Hunter Dickinson, and you see Big C and help and comes over and affects some shots at the rim out of help side. That's where I think you could see an impact from him here early in the season. Want to see what he looks like Saturday? Want to take that into the two exhibition games? We do know this: he will play because he has no option to. They're going to need some minutes at that spot from him, and uh, it is Kentucky basketball season. And it is between now and April, hopefully, Jack. And uh, it's going to be nice to talk about something other than just off-season storylines. We're actually going to be able to look at these guys on the floor and talk about what they look like, what we want to see them do more of, and the storylines create themselves. That's my favorite part about this time of year. Call your shot. How many SEC Media Day is coming up, too, tomorrow, right? right? Tomorrow. Yeah, Yeah, so we're – a lot of stuff coming. Call my shot what? How many minutes does Big Z play on Saturday? This Saturday? Oh, no, no, no. 
minutes, but also project his stat line. How many shots does he get? What's what what is his production going to look like with the minutes that he that he earns? Oh gosh, man, you're really throwing me out there. I'm going to say he plays somewhere in that 27, 28 minute range. Maybe well, they're shorthanded. I'll, I'll I'll say 30. I'm going to say we see him out there for 30 minutes. I'm going to say he gets a double double. Biggest dude on the floor. He's going to grab some rebounds. He's going to dunk some balls. Could you imagine if Triple he goes double. out there? Yeah. <laughs> what if what if he goes out there and just go 25, 15, and eight blocks? Like, what happens then? Like, everything we've said about this team, we're like, yep, throw it in the garbage. Big Z's the truth. I like how Cal in his weird, awkward interview with, with Z uh, talked about how, you know, he's not King Kong. He's not – the the answer to all of our dreams, but the kid can play. He ended it going, he's going to be good. Yeah, like, he's gonna I, be I like yeah. I like the confidence, man. And it would just be hilarious. It would be so funny if he goes out there and just destroys the competition. And is like, this is college basketball. I've been playing pro ball overseas forever. This is what I'm supposed to be playing. Like, I'm going to put thirty points a game over here. That'd be hilarious. It's not going to happen, but I I, I I'm going to go twenty five minutes. For conditioning reasons, I think he's only twenty five minutes, and we're going to get a nice eight and six out of Z. I think it's going to be a nice, productive, ease him into college basketball, put him in position to succeed. If he hits a three, crowd's going to go absolutely. The, the, the roof is going to cave in if he hits a couple shots. But I'm I'm really just looking forward to seeing what this everything we've built up to this point, all the talking points, all the nonsense and roller coaster of the academics and all that. I thought it was hilarious that Cal threw. 36 jabs and he's a com communications major. I literally just pulled him out of class for this interview, you know, understanding that, Hey, he, this kid can understand this conversation just as well as anybody on this team. Way to go admissions. I, I appreciated the jabs and stuff, but I'm excited to be past all of that stuff and just get to see him play basketball. He has earned this moment. The staff has earned this moment. Let's see what we got in big Z. It'll be fun. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 12 and 10. 12 points, 10 rebounds, because he's going to be on the floor a lot, the biggest body on the floor. Um, I hope he gets 25 minutes at least. I think your number is a safe bet there, that I hope it's 25. If he gets into 25 to 30, play him as much as you can. Give him a taste of it. Let him get out there and, and get comfortable. Because this is a – anytime you come into a new environment, you're nervous. And I know for him it's probably even greater because he's not just in a new environment. He's in a new country. He's here with guys he did not know. I'm sure there was some back and forth communication between guys on this roster and him once he committed, though. I'm sure that there was something being built. But the thing that that stands out, too, is I got to see those guys at football Saturday. And as I was walking in, they were all there and they had a football and they're having a blast. I mean, they were like 12 year old kids out there in the parking lot throwing football back and forth. And Big Z, like you could see him cutting up and having a good time with those guys. And he posted an Instagram picture, I believe, from Madness. Go look at the comments. It's all of his teammates in it. Let's that have the that we've talked about. It's it's carrying over now. To to me, it was probably an easy transition for him because it, it seems like all these guys like each other, and everybody's on the same page, and they also know that that dude's pretty important to where they want to go. All these guys are from the top down. It's it's basketball season, Jack. This long off season that we've had, it's here. And obviously, you've 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 got the biggest part of your life coming up here, hopefully soon. So, wishing you and you and Katie well the next few days, and I'll be right here carrying us through it. I'm very excited to do my first show with him, like right here, and just like you like, better, you better as as we're doing the show, just special like, guest. Yeah, the, uh, he'll he'll be my new special guest for all of our uh, future shows, but. I, you won't see me the next week or two, uh, but we'll, we'll still have these shows. It'll still be a good time. Great content coming. Maybe we'll do like a check-in, like maybe while the baby's crying or something, I'll like be on my phone and jump in. <laughs> it's like, I'll be the KS board question of the week. So how the hell do you change a diaper? You know, something like that. That'll be my, uh, my own personal KS board question of the week. Maybe I'll check in. We'll see what happens. It depends on how chaotic things get, but it is basketball season. We are very much looking forward to uh, having real basketball to look at and talk about. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait, Sean. Let's go ahead, get out of here. Where can fans find your work? You can follow me on Twitter at GBB country. 
Find me on Twitter as well, at Jack Pilgrim KSR. Reach out to me via email, jpilgrim at KentuckySportsRadio.com. With that, we'll be back next time from the Jam Packed Sources Say Podcast. We will see you then.